Well, let me start with reading some excerpts from the book, and then I'm going to go into some, to, since I, I've covered a ton of material, uh, I'm going to give you a sort of a, a brief tour, since most of you probably haven't read the book, right? So, so you'll see where we go. <laughs> First is a quote from a British sociologist who really founded the organ donation system, uh, the, the way we conceive of it now. Uh, his name is Richard Titmus, uh, and he wrote this in 1970. If blood, as a living human tissue, is increasingly bought and sold as an article of commerce, and profit accrues from such transactions, then it follows that the laws of commerce must in the end prevail. And the second quote I want to read is from Maria Selvam, who's uh, an activist in <coughs> India, uh, who uh, witnessed one of the sort of more egregious kidney scams uh, that existed that I reported on. In other parts of India, people say that they're going to Malaysia or the United States with a glimmer of hope in their eyes. In Tsunami Nagar, people speak that way about selling their kidneys. Uh, I weigh just, this is the introduction to the book, I weigh just a little under 200 pounds. I have brown hair and blue eyes and a full set of teeth. As far as I know, my thyroid gland pumps the right hormones into the 12 pints of blood that circulate in my arteries and veins. At six foot two, I have long femurs and tibias with solid connective tissue. Both my kidneys function properly and my heart runs at a steady clip of about 87 beats per minute. All in, I figure I'm worth about $250,000. My blood, it separates neatly into plasma, red blood cells, platelets, and clotting factor, and would save the life of someone on an operating table, or stem the uncontrollable spilling of a hemophiliac's blood. The ligaments that keep me together can be scraped from my bones and implanted in the knee of an Olympian athlete. The hair on my head could be made into a wig, or reduced into amino acids and sold in baked goods as a leavening agent. My skeleton would make a striking addition to any biology classroom. Observe. Uh, my major organs, my heart, my liver, my kidneys, they could go to prolong the lives of people whose organs have failed. And my corneas could be sliced off to restore the sight to the blind. Even after death, a determined pathologist could turn off his cell phone. Oh, even after death, a determined pathologist could harvest my sperm and use it to help a woman conceive. The baby would have a value all of its own, so the cycle can repeat of value. Since I'm an American, my flesh, it sells at a premium, but if I were sold in China, I'd be worth much, much less. The doctors and brokers that move the pieces of my body through markets stand to make a considerable sum, much more than I ever could as a seller, and for their services. And it turns out that the global laws of supply and demand are as fixed in organ markets as they are for shoes and electronics. In the same way that a mechanic can swap out worn car parts for new ones and oil creaky joints to get an engine running again, a surgeon can prolong someone's life by trading broken pieces for new ones. Every year the technology barriers get lower and the process gets cheaper, but unlike mechanics, humans have no readily available sources for spare parts. There's no scrap heap that we can harvest from. Recent attempts to, uh, at creating artificial hearts uh, and organs and kidneys and blood, they all pale in comparison to the real thing. The human body is just too complex. At the moment, the body can't be re replicated in a factory or a lab, which means that the only way that we have right now to meet the demand for body parts is to find sources of raw materials in the populations of dead and, recent, uh, and living people. So I'm here to talk to you about the global trade in human bodies and body parts, uh, especially what happens when these markets cross <coughs> international borders. For more than a century, medical innovations have allowed us to move body parts between individuals. Uh, in the age of cheap international travel, entire businesses, both legal and illegal, meet the demand for almost every piece of the body. There's literally billions of dollars to be made in at least a dozen entirely independent markets for human flesh. 
But at the same time that we're making bundles of cash selling bodies, people also engage, the brokers, they engage in, in a really weird ethical uh, rationalization for what they do, why they do it. On one level, we want to think that our body is above the hard scrabble logic of the market. We don't want to think that our bodies are worth $250,000, right? We're born with this, we want, it, we want to, to, to think that somehow we're special. But at the same time, we want to have access to other people's body parts, right? You know, if something were going to go horribly wrong, uh, we wanted to go to a hospital to get a blood transfusion. If uh, your kidneys fail, you're going to want a kidney transplant. If you prove infertile and you want donor eggs, you want a place to get these eggs. Um, and if you, you know, God forbid that doesn't even work, you want to be able to find a surrogate mother to bear your child. At the very least, we want to say we can adopt children from other places. And we, we see these as, as, as goods in themselves. But, so how do we resolve this dilemma between wanting a market for human body parts and at the same time not sullying this sacredness uh, of whatever it is that makes us human, that makes us special? And that's really the, the fundamental issue that I'm trying to uncover, is we want to both be modern people in society with all this technological advancement and yet still rely on just, you know, our flesh. That's all we've got in the world. So I spent six years investigating the dark side of this human supply chain. By and large, I'm not interested in what happens when we receive human body parts and consume them, either through surgeries, hairstyles, shoring up our families, but how the bodies get there in the first place. So you're not going to, I've never reported on a story of some guy who had kidney failure and got a kidney and then had a happy life afterwards. That's a great story. I, I, I love that story. But ultimately, that's the supply of the demand for kidneys. And that's not what I'm interested in. Where, where do these come from and why are we not talking about where organs and blood and everything else come from. Uh, my journey has taken me to India, to Cyprus, to Spain, to Bangladesh, uh, across the United States, uh, I've reported in China and sort of other parts of the world as well. It's taken me inside the, the respected glass and steel institutions of the first world, and here we're in one now, right? Uh, and into the back dens of criminal hideouts in the third. I've met with police, lawyers, victims, ordinary business folks trying to make their livings, and and all the markets that I've explored, that one thing has stood out. It's that everyone, no matter who you talk to, thinks that they're doing the right thing. You know, I've never met the organ broker who says, oh yeah, it's great, I just murdered all these people for my organs. I've never heard that line. They all say, yes, yeah, so we've saved, you know, 150 lives with my services. And that's the way people talk about this. Um, they always think that they're helping people at the end of the supply chain. They don't think twice about where it comes from or what sort of, you know, things they have to do to create that supply. And so, if you'll allow me, I'm going to show you the beginning of that supply chain. And if there's one rule that is true across all these red markets, uh, is that flesh, it always moves up the social hierarchy. Uh, it's exceedingly rare to find someone in America who's willing to give a kidney to an Indian slum dweller or a child from America adopted to Guatemala. These are just not stories that we've ever heard of. I, to my knowledge, it has never happened, but maybe you'll find one case. Uh, by and large, the blood still comes from the lower and middle classes in America, with major blood banks springing up now across the Mexican border. Uh, you'll also realize, you may not know, that, that America is a net blood exporter. We export more blood around the world than any other country in the world, to the tune of $3 billion a year of it. Uh, and most drug tests, human guinea pigs, are either college students, like yourselves, or itinerants, like, no, not like you guys, but both of whom uh, participate in the studies for cash. Uh, so, in the, and I want to just make a point that this is not a wholesale critique of our current system. I, 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 it's just where things can go wrong. And I want to show you that when they go wrong, how terrible they can really turn out to be. Uh, and especially when things go across borders, it gets even worse. But ultimately, I'm not, I don't want to tear down the system. I don't want people to leave this lecture and say, down with blood banks. That's definitely not the route we're taking here. Um, so I'd like to start, before I run, run through the, some of the stories that I've examined, I want to talk a little bit about how we got to the system 
of organ donation and blood donation that we have today. Uh, and this really starts in the 1800s, uh, where, where, where we look at the history of the blood business, which is really the first human body part that is easily transferable between individuals. Um, well, not so easy. Because in the 18th century, blood transfusions, they could do them, but it was like playing Russian roulette. You, you know, you, you're, you, you've got a wagon ran over you, you need a blood transfusion stat, and they're going to, they'll, they'll, they, they tried it because they knew it worked sometimes, but oftentimes the blood types didn't mix, and you just died on the operating table. They're like, oh, I don't know how he died, it must have been ghosts, or I don't know what they, they thought. Um, in 1901, uh, Viennese scientist Karl Landsteiner discovered blood types. Um, and, you know, at that point, blood donation suddenly made sense. They're like, oh, you have A and you have AB and she can give blood to you, but you can't give to her. And, and suddenly this is like a sea change. Like, the, you know, their eyes open up and now <coughs> surgeries can suddenly happen because people aren't dying on the operating, every operating table. And between 1901 and 1919, the technology sort of spreads. Uh, and in 1919, uh, these were like, uh, sorry, but in that time period, it was like person to person direct transfusions. In, in 1919, the U.S. Army develops a way to store type O blood and, tr and treat soldiers at the uh, Battle of Cambrai. And this is the first time that they were able to like, stockpile blood and move it to the, the soldiers in the battlefield. Um, and, and so between 1919 uh, and 1937, uh, sort of hospitals organized independent, sort of you know, heart, you know, not very well organized, but in 37, Cook County Hospital here in Chicago forms the first blood bank. Uh, in 1940, so we're, we're getting into World War II, blood and plasma drives around the United States and the UK become a really important weapon of war. We're not, we're not just looking at, at blood as saving you in your car accident, but we want to keep these soldiers uh, to, to come back to the battlefield and fight again. And this is what really drives the, the original markets for blood. Um, and, and in this time, there are two different types of blood systems that appeared. One is the American system and one is the British system. And in the British system, and I'm going to simplify this hugely, um, in the British system it was donor-based. You know, they said, your nation is under attack and you need to give blood to keep our soldiers alive. And, the, and, and they, 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 you know, sort of the Red Cross model. And lots of blood went to the, the, the front for that. In the U.S., they had, we, had that don't, we had that altruistic system, uh, you know, come <laughs> save our soldiers, but we also said, well, we can also just pay people for their blood and we'll get even more. And, and so, you know, that worked as well, believe it or not. Um, and, you know, it, we developed a new technology for, for um, transporting blood plasma. That we took out the platelets and by doing that, we could, we, it could send across the sea without, um, without storing problems. It, whole blood goes bad quicker, who knew? Um, and so I want to ask a question. Now, when, when in September 11th, what were, how old were you guys? Oh, wait, ne never mind. This is not going to work. <laughs> so people who are older, <laughs> say 18 or older, uh, September 11th, did, any of you, did, did anyone uh, give blood on September 11th or go to the blood banks at that time? Oh, weird. Okay. Well, I did. Um, I was in New York City when, uh, after September. I was reporting on that, that mess. And one of the things that struck out is all the blood banks were just packed. There were lines around the block. I and mean, there's so much blood. It was one of the first times, that I, in my knowledge, that everyone wanted to get blood because there was this sense of patriotic duty, you know, even though not many people needed blood. You know, you died or you didn't. Um, uh, the... But, but there's this sense of sort of national pride in giving blood, and that was sort of this altruistic model, and us using our bodies, and that's a pretty positive, positive system. Um, and that's the, ultimately the British system, too, and I'll get to that in a second. But in 1956, in the United States, there was, there was the, the, it came to a head where we had two systems here. The, world, the war was over, blood uh, drives were going down, and we had this, I'll pay you for blood, and you'll, you know, or you'll give me your blood. And, and one was collected by Red Cross nonprofit people, and one was like these, you know, commercial blood banks. And it, it became pretty obvious at that time that the commercial blood banks showed up at all the places you find payday loans now and cash for gold services. They were on sort of the edges of the city, poor areas, skid rows, and they were 
horrible conditions. Um, the, you know, the, the reports from that time that I've read say there were maggots on the floor. You'd go in there, it'd be dirty, you'd get the blood, uh, and, and it, would, it would sort of go into the system. So the doctors realized that, that the blood from commercial blood banks was just poor quality because the donor base was lower and the, and the profit motive lowered standards. The, the blood from donors was high quality because it was these people who were just saying, hey, you know, we want to give out of the goodness of our heart. And there was no sort of class basis on this. Uh, and in Kansas, what happened is the doctors said, we don't want to buy um, blood from the commercial blood banks anymore. It's just bad blood. We don't want it. It's just negative for everyone. And, and so they started buying all their blood from these donor-based blood banks. And in 56, in Kansas, they, the, Feder the, the Kansas Blood Bank Commercial Union filed a, a, a lawsuit with the Federal Trade Commission saying that this is unfair business practice. You know, you're undercutting our profits by getting free, free raw materials, and that should be illegal. And they won. And for years, the Kansas City doctors had to buy blood from the, uh, from the dangerous supply because you don't want unfair competition. It eventually was overturned. It took two or three years, but the, the decision was overturned and people came to their senses. But it led to this, um, this new understanding about why, what is, what is this human body? You know, why, why, what, are we, what are we actually really buying and selling here? And, and Richard Titmus, who's the guy I opened this conversation with, um, he's a British soci sociologist and he really explored the statistics involved, how much hepatitis was being, going from commercial blood banks and how much um, was coming from the, the, the normal blood banks. And he statistically proved that it was really bad. And he said that we need to create a model that is totally based on altruism. It should be like the September 11th giving. You're, you're giving for your nation, you're giving for the general health of the community, and this is not, the human body is not a commodity. Uh, and it was, a, it was a really powerful argument. He wrote the book in 1970. Um, and th his book was actually quoted in 1984 on the Hall of Congress um, in the founding of the National Organ uh, Transplant Act, saying that all blood, I and, and, all, and by extension later all human body parts as well, are going to be nonprofit. We cannot, they have to come from from willing donors, and we cannot look at the body, uh, as Al Gore says, as an assemblage of spare parts. This was, and this was very important. And this is really, it was only in 84, and some of you were probably born around 84, right? Uh, maybe a little later. Um, uh, it, it was only then that, that, this, that this happens, uh, that, we start th that we start enshrining in law that the body is, is more important than something you can just barter for. And that sort of sets up the, the, the situation that I'm looking at here is, is what happens when you, when you get an altruistic system that's that, uh, of donation, but you build a commercial system on top of it? You know, what happens when, when uh, a kidney has to be given by a donor, and yet the hospital sells the kidney for $67,000 to $250,000, depending on your options? Um, what happens then? It, 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 can there be a supply of altruistic, um, of anything altruistic, uh, and, and you have a commercial system on top of it? So, without further ado, I'm going to go into me. Uh, so, in and, and, uh, it's a little bit of my personal journey, so you understand how I got here. In 2006, I was a broke graduate student in Wisconsin. I, I, I had just sort of thought maybe I'd drop out of my anthropology PhD. I wasn't having it. I wasn't very good at it. Um, and I had no real plan of what I was going to do next. And I needed money really quickly because students, believe it or not, are not super wealthy. <laughs> and a friend of mine who was a, 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 interesting enough, a Sudanese refugee, had, knew how I could make money. He said, Scott, you have to check out the back pages of the weekly paper, the Isthmus, if any of you guys know it, um, and you can enroll in drug trials and they will pay you money. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's great. Um, and I checked it out and, and, and uh, there's a clinical trial research organization called a CRO in, 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 uh, in Madison that, that, um, that 
hundreds of people just go to and, and rent their body out for trials and you, you fill a little online application, they give you a call back and they say, you're go. And I, within a week, I was signed up to rent my body to Bayer Pharmaceuticals to test out the erectile dysfunction drug Levitra. Uh, and I got locked in a room with 30 other dudes. Uh, <laughs> there were no ladies there. Um, and, and they were going, and I signed a contract that said I was an altruistic donor uh, for my body and they would compensate me to the tune of $2,500 for four weekends of my life on penis poppers. <laughs> now, I didn't realize how carefully chosen these words war were, uh, that, that altruistic donor and compensation. Uh, these, these were not... Uh, guy who wants to make money off, dr off drug trials and remuneration to the tune of, to the, this, this, they, they, they very specifically chose these, these words, uh, that allowed them to cheaply access my body uh, uh, and other bodies of human test subjects. And it, it seemed to me as a really good deal at the time. I mean, that, that was a lot of money to me. Uh, still is a lot of money. But, but what does it mean when you sell your body to science? Is this really altruism? And is, is some, and, and if it is altruism, what, what is, what broader social good is happening when I'm giving my body to Levitra? You know, what, and is, is this altruism for, how is altruism part of a for-profit system? I didn't know. But I did know that about 30 men, of the 30 men on the trial, there were five professional human guinea pigs. And these are individuals who traveled around the country from testing center to testing center. Um, starting, I believe it was in Florida, and they would go to Philly and New York, and they, they worked their way up to Madison, and I think they ended in Fairbanks. And they would earn $60,000 a year <coughs> selling their body to science. Uh, and they had special tricks that they told me, that you know, you'd rub vitamin A on your veins to make the things go away, the, the bumps, so that your veins could be good, because your veins are your conduit to cash. Um, and you know, they had, the, they had tricks for how to, how to talk to interviewers, and you know, the pharma companies don't want professional guinea pigs. Um, they, want, they want human bodies. They know that there are professional guinea pigs. But, but they don't want them because you never know what sort of chemicals are running through one of these guinea pigs' bodies, right? And, and as you, you know, it could skew the data. You have an experimental drug from study A in Philly, and two weeks later you're getting study B in Madison. This is a problem. And indeed, Pharmaceutical companies would rather you've never taken a drug in your whole life. They'd rather you be what's called treatment naive, which is truly, you know, you've had every, you know, you've never had a disease, you've never had a, an anything, and they can just test this total blank slate. But, you know, obviously that's not possible. So they, they, they make do um, with what they can. And, and, you know, these side effects can delay the time it takes a drug to, to come to market. A drug like Levitra, we're talking billions and billions of dollars in profits. And in that aspect, 2,500 bucks is not that much money to go into that. Uh, and, but in the, drug <laughs> the drug companies have a problem. In order to produce a marketable drug, they need to churn out a huge amount of testing data from human subjects. The most dangerous is phase one, which is what I was involved with. That tests the, your, the body's tolerance to like how much Levitra can you put into a person before they explode. <laughs> 30 milligrams. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, the companies have to pay a lot of money for this. And, you know, to take a drug to, from phase one animal studies all the way to, um, f through phase three and on to market uh, can cost a billion dollars. It's not, this is not, this is not small research uh, things. Uh, and soon I learned um, that that as with many things on what I call the red market, that companies found that going abroad made a lot more sense than doing it in the United States. You could get less regulatory oversight. Um, you could, there, there are discrepancy in national incomes, meaning you could remunerate people uh, you know, for less. Um, and, you know, and all in, pharmaceutical manufacturers could, could save between one-third and two-thirds off of the, the drug cost. So this is a hugely profitable industry. Uh, and now billions of dollars are being sent, uh, as of probably about 2001, um, billions of dollars are going to India, China, Mexico, and Eastern Europe for drug studies. Uh, this is useful because in those countries, because they have such poor health infrastructure, they have a lot of treatment naive people. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense for them to want to go there. They feel like they get better data, they can do more 
bad things to people's bodies. Um, and it's no shock that bad things happen. Um, that, you know, Johns Hopkins was, in, it was recently, uh, 2005, had been found uh, in, impreg not impregnated, <laughs> giving a cancer drug, <laughs> uh, giving an giving a, a, a anti-cancer drug to, uh, I think it was, uh, it was either 80 or 180 um, pregnant women. Uh, totally, you know, possibly just, you know, d destroying their fetuses, causing um, birth defects and things like that. Uh, it, totally ignoring the protocols because Indian regulatory infrastructure is just not there. So these companies just come in and totally um, destroy it. We, we also have instances where uh, they've told people that this drug will cure AIDS. Um, uh, to, to a bunch of people who are infected, which I'll get to how they got infected later. Um, but a bunch of people who are, well, they were infected by, um, by illegal blood um, selling in, in China. A bunch of people sold their blood and got infected by uh, the reuse of needles. And so in this province, m m thousands of people contracted AIDS and the government didn't help out. And then the pharma companies were like, great, we have all these people of AIDS who've never been treated, we're gonna come in there and, and test the drugs out. They would come in and test the drugs and they'd leave telling them that they were you know, going to be cured. Just horrible, dangerous stuff that's going on. And this is the world that's sort of developing in clinical trials. We don't know exactly how bad it's going to be because there's no way to investigate their files. They're not, gonna sh they don't, they're not obligated at all to show um, what they were doing. And so this was my first story, and this is sort of how I entered into the red market. I'm thinking, hey, I've sold my body, other people are selling their bodies. And as my, you know, broke graduate student self said, I'm going to go abroad. And I moved to India to follow the story. Uh, and I did more on drug trials, but you'll have to read the book, so I'm not going to tell you more about that. Um, and we're on to bones. And this is a bag of tibias, which... Uh, or leg bones uh, that I found on the, uh, the Indo-Nepal border. That's actually not true. I found it on the Indo-Bhutan border uh, uh, where I was looking for where skeletons in medicals, like when you're in, in, in taking, going to medical school, there's skeletons hanging in the corner of the classroom, right? Or you're studying osteology. Where do these bones come from? There are millions of them out there. And uh, I wanted to find out where they were coming from. I sort of knew. Um, so, grave robbery has been a problem with anatomy students since about the 1400s when we first started exploring the human body. And you, you probably have heard of this happening where medical students will go into a graveyard, dig up human bodies and, and get, you know, the anatomical knowledge from them on the dissecting table. This was more or less the way it was done until the 1850s uh, about, where, where as just part of medical school, as sort of your, your entering rites, you just go to the graveyard and you'd snatch a body. And this caused <coughs> riots all over. You know, there, there were, in, in the United States, there were 17 anatomy riots between 1780s and like the, I think it was the 1880s, uh, where they would burn down medical schools. I would not be surprised if Northwestern wasn't burned down at some point uh, for this. I don't know. I mean, you could, you could check. Uh, tell me if you find out. Um, and because you'd have like things like you know when you're studying it, you sort of make jokes about the human body because you're trying to desensitize yourself. And there's these stories of people like waving like severed arms out of windows at passerby. It's horrible stuff, and you know it's why they rioted. Um, uh, but also when when you're when you're when you're dissecting a human cadaver, you you sort of cut through everything and you, you ruin the, the, the bones as well. I mean, the bones can sort of get, get chopped up and you look inside. So we also need a supply of human skeletons that's separate from our anatomical dissection system. And because of all these riots in, in both the UK and the US, uh, the British, who had these great colonial system that they, they enjoyed thoroughly, found out that they could just outsource the problem to India and just take the bo bodies from their graves and send them out to the rest of the world. And it, it began in the 1860s at Calcutta Medical College, uh, and they very quickly became the primary supplier for human bones around the world. Um, by 1980, well, every doctor would, would buy a human box of bones. It would be about $300 uh, to, to buy a bone box. And, uh, and 
you know, it was great because you got to study in a real human skeleton and you, you need this knowledge to become a good doctor. I mean, I, I definitely don't want to have my, my body fixed by a doctor who hasn't looked at a human body before. So these are essential things. But by 1984, the skeleton trade was so big that in Calcutta, they sold more than 60,000 skeletons every year. So literally, this is, th these were, there, I think there were like 18 supply companies. I could probably check that figure. But, uh, um, you had to think that, that, that all of these graveyards were just being emptied. You know, people were building uh, uh, concrete vaults over graves of, of, of Christians there. Uh, Muslims would post guards on their, on their at, at outside graveyards. Uh, Hindus who burned their dead uh, had to sit through the whole cremation just to be sure it was, like, turned into dust. Or else, the, the body would get sold and for, like, eh, probably about $25, they would be able to resell this body to a, an anatomical supply company. This became illegal in 1985 um, when a bone exporter was found having exported 1,500 child skeletons. Um, child skeletons were more valuable. You could sell them for more because it showed different, uh, you know, stages of growth. Adolescent skeletons, you know, baby teeth, all that stuff. Um, and when that happened, when they found 1,500 children, they didn't think that they could get these legally or, you know, e even illegally from, from just robbing graves. They figured that this guy had murdered 1,500 children. They arrested him in Bihar, uh, and within short order, more riots happened, and the trade was just shut down. And no doctors in America could get um, anatomical skeletons anymore. It was actually really interesting to read the papers from that period, going back through the archives, because all the medical schools are freaking out. They're like, where are we going to get bones? We need bones. We need to open up those trades immediately. Um, not really talking about um, this problem. But in 2007, I was like, well, I, I read this report in a local newspaper that there are a hundred skeletons found in West, in, in Purbastali, West Bengal. Um, and and it was just like a 50-word article, of, you know, really short. 100 skeletons found. Isn't that funny? Uh, and so I went there and I found that the skeleton trade is still very much going on. It's underground and they're still exporting these skeletons and still robbing graves. And, uh, and most of the time doctors just don't ask. So if you say your skeleton is ethically sourced, you, you get sort of a pass. And it's, uh, it's horrible. This is a guy. His, his, his family his, his Manoj Paul. I found him at midnight during a monsoon. It was really sort of fun. Um, his family has worked in, worked in the bone trade since the British era. era. He told me that he, he remembers like these two propeller planes flying into his village, loading them up with skeletons and flying them out. Uh, and, and he was really upset that his factory was recently shut down. Um, he, one of his friends accidentally bragged in a... Uh, uh, while well, he was drunk at a bar, uh, that, that they weren't getting enough for grave robbing anymore. And, and, uh, and then the police found him and, and decided to shut him down. He still says it's legal. This is where they were being exported out. It's called Young Brothers Anatomical Booksellers or whatever. I can't read that. It's called Young Brothers. Yeah. Young Brothers Anatomical Suppliers in Calcutta. Uh, when I, you know, it, it was busted first in 2004 or, or three. Uh, and they found like bodies boiling on the roof with, and they were deflashed. It was uh, horrible stuff. Um, and they, and so I found, I, I tried to track them and I found that this company in Canada w is still importing skeletons from, the, from there. I called him up on the phone. He said, yeah, that's where we get them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I, I so recently uh, I'm, I'm sort of, sort of wondering where this trade is still going. I, 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 I know that, that they're still exporting illegally, not huge quantities of skeletons. We're not talking 60,000, we're talking 100 skeletons a year, not, not, not huge volumes. But I have found that, that you can still buy human teeth in vast quantities. Um, and th this comes from a reseller on, from his website in South India. And uh, I just wonder, where do you get 1,000 healthy human teeth from? I don't know. Uh, so I want to go on to a more charismatic section. So these won't have clear endings, unfortunately. I want to give you a little punchline, but you're not going to get them. Uh, in, uh, and after I'd reported on this story, that, that skeletons are still going on, uh, the, industry is t the industry is still going on, um, in 2007, 
I found, uh, so in, in 2005, the, the on Christ, day after Christmas, a, a tsunami happened off Indonesia. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced and killed in India. Um, villages were just wiped away, boats washed out to rivers. And what happened immediately after the international aid community came in and brought people in to, uh, to refugee camps. And these were, they were horribly impoverished. People really had no sources of income. They couldn't fish anymore. And people like this woman found that the only way that they could make money was to sell their kidneys. Uh, indeed, right after the tsunami, organ brokers just descended on these camps and said, hey, we have a huge diabetes problem in, in India. It's a, one of the worst diabetes problems in the world because uh, there's so much sugar in the diet that, um, that after every disaster, after every earthquake, every tsunami, everything, you, you have these organ brokers sent, sent from hospitals that, that go around saying, hey, do anyone want to make 800 bucks for their kidney? And uh, I went to this, this you know, You've, you've probably heard of the story of, of uh, someone waking up in a bathtub full of ice, right? You know, they go to Tijuana, they get drunk, some lady seduces them, they wake up without their kidneys the next day. Uh, that doesn't happen. There's, there's, uh, there's no bathtubs involved. Um, w what happens instead is they'll kidnap you from a bus stand and, and lock you in a room until they take your kidney. Uh, it won't happen to anyone in this room ever, most likely. It will only happen to someone who's poor. <laughs> and lives in a third world country. But you know, there, the guy was arrested uh, for doing this 500 times uh, two years ago in Delhi. Uh, but far more common than that, far more than the horror story, it's that people like this come in and, and we think that, that kidneys aren't supposed to be these, these commercially available organs, right? Uh, kidneys are, are things that, that you were, were supposed to be altruistically given. And the laws around the world, based off Titmus, say that these are not it's not the way you do it. Um, and yet, about 10% of all, according to the WHO, about 10% of all live organ transplants are done illegally on the black market. And the model's pretty simple. A person, whether they're from the United States or from their, their rich person in their home country, uh, will get a contract with an organ broker who says that they can find a kidney. They, their kidneys have failed. And, and instead of waiting 10 years on dialysis, for a treatment, um, they'll contact one of these people and they'll either kidnap someone and take their kidney, that's rare, or they'll go to a woman like this and say, hey, do you want $2,000? And uh, you know, median income in India, uh, for, for, you know, per, she probably makes $400 a year. That uh, $2,000 is a huge amount of money. Uh, she has no you know, available income, right? No, 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 no huge options, no employment. Uh, she'll say, yes, I'll sell my kidney. They'll take her to a hospital. They'll extract the kidney, um, and then she'll go back to the broker and say, give me the rest of the money. And he says, no, uh, it's my money. So he, she, he gave her an advance of $800. And, uh, and then she becomes an organ broker to get, to get the money. So she tells her friend, hey, I, I know somebody who, who will buy a kidney from you. And then she takes that person's $800 and sells it to a friend. And, the, and it sort of proliferates in this way. In, uh, in, in this area, in this village, uh, I, I met 80 women who had sold their kidneys. They all had these sort of elongated kidney extraction scars, which you can see there. Um, and this is why I, I opened that quote. Uh, in other parts of India, they say that going to Malaysia, the United States, they, with this glimmer of hope in their eyes. In Tsunami Nagar, people speak that way of selling their kidneys. This is their social, uh, this is their safety net. Uh, and and that, that, this, I think, is, is wrong. Uh, in all cases of organ trafficking, we, we, we defer to doctors, these guys with lab coats, and, and they tell you that, that you're, they're going to give you the right ethically sourced thing. You come there with a problem and you say that the, you could fix it. And there's something about that, that lab coat that commands respect. These doctors want to help their patients and see, uh, and, and they see that the prospect of giving an organ to a patient with organ failure is a necessary good in itself. And when you talk to them, that's what they always say, we're saving people's lives. Um, oftentimes they ignore entirely this, this supply chain and what they're actually doing when they go to a broker and say, let's go provide a kidney. Um, currently you can get this basic procedure uh, for done, done for about $14,000 in India, Pakistan, the Philippines, Egypt, and China. Uh, it's pretty reasonably easy to arrange. Uh, they'll arrange a donor with no questions asked, and you can buy a kidney 
totally without an identity. You'll never meet this woman. You'll go there, you'll, you'll, you'll pay your money to the transplant, and you'll get it. Um, and it's just like they were a slab of meat at a grocery store in a way. Uh, that's, at least that's how it's presented to you. You can just go get it. Um, and if you do ask, if you do ask where this organ came from, they invariably retreat to this sort of notion we have in the United States of patient confidentiality. Is they'll say, oh, it would be very bad to introduce you to this kidney donor because it would be very embarrassing for them. They, they don't want to know that they, they were, you know, how, for whatever reason. And patient's privacy is the ultimate um, uh, guiding light for a lot of these things. And I think this is a, this is a real problem because take, for instance, how this happened with her. The, the transplant authorization committee in Tamil Nadu uh, can be bribed for as little as $50. They're the only people who have access to the kidney organ transplant records and they have, there's no way to actually investigate this until it goes to the police and the police can get a court order to investigate um, these, these organ trades. It's, it's like we've given the keys of this whole industry, uh, to, it's like giving the keys to a bank to a convicted burglar. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a really weird thing. And when this, this scandal broke, there were, I think it was like a hundred hospitals implicated in this in Chennai. And the, the health minister came and told everyone, uh, got all the doctors together in a room and made them swear never to do it again. And that was the only uh, oversight <laughs> that happened. Um, kidney trade gets even worse. In India, at least, it's, it's commercial and we see these people sort of go into it with, with knowledge. Um, uh, but in China, there's a, the state policy is that they, they sell the organs of executed prisoners. That's, that's the law. Uh, and the, what you could do up until last year, uh, it, and maybe continuing, I just don't have more recent information, is within two weeks you could call up a Chinese hospital and get a, ki a matching kidney within two weeks. Um, which is, if you think about the organ transplant list here, it's, it's, it's a very long time. So what they've actually done is they've tissue typed all of their prisoners and the executions are done on demand uh, there. And, and some of the, and we know that's happening. What we don't know is if it's, if they're all convicted murderers who are tissue type or if it's also like political prisoners. And there, there's a very, I think there's very good evidence to say, to say that it is, you know, really anyone who's in their prison system that they can sell for $60,000. Um, but all this begs the question is, is who has the right to buy her flesh? You know, at what point does, does this woman kidney become your kidney? How do we ethically rationalize this in the United States? How, or how, how if, if I have, if my father's or organs fail or my organs fail, how can I go to this person and say, say, you owe me an organ? Is, is it just money that we're allowing to, to make these ethical rationalizations? Is, is, is ultimately that the, the, the primary moral driver? And, and increasingly, that is. It's, it's only about economics. Uh, so this is Kala. Um, there's 80 other pictures like her. This is Maria Selvam, who, uh, who uh, exposed the kidney trade for the first time in Chennai and, sort of, and, and actually has been quite harassed since then. Um, here's a kidney coming out. You can really just go there and ask to take a photo of a kidney operation. It's pretty funny. Um, okay. How much time do I have? Is someone? 10 or 12 minutes. 10 or 12 minutes? All right, so we're going to give you the, the speed tour of, of a couple more uh, things. Uh, so the red market really proliferates across everything. Once you conceive of a body as a commodity, the depths of depravity really, they really know no bounds. I was talking about blood earlier. This is the entire legal blood supply of a city called Gorakhpur on the Indo-Nepal border. Uh, that's it, that's it. What's that, like 12 pints of blood? Um, and the city is of, of over a million people. Uh, so, where do you get blood? You, s there, there, you still need to get it from somewhere. Here's a guy with blood. Um, here's in 2009, a former dairy farmer uh, turned blood dealer named Papo Yadav was arrested for holding people in a small jail cell and draining their blood three times a week. He held the captives there for three years uh, and blood from that would have gone to treat patients like these. Uh, what happened is, is in, in, in 2009, one of the guys who was locked in this shed, he just 
forgot to padlock the door, and the guy sort of hobbled out and told told some farmers that he had been uh, he and some other people were captured by these blood what vampires pirates I don't know what you want to call them, um, and when they they brought them out. They're, they were so drained of blood that you could pinch their skin like this and it would stay in that, in that form. They were there for three years. Every week they would, they would lose a pint of blood and they were kept minimally conscious so that they couldn't actually resist. Um, it started out actually just by paying them. He, he, went, he would go to the bus station and say, hey, do you want to buy, do you want to you make a quick, I don't know, 25 bucks? And they would say, yeah, it was less, it was actually two bucks. Um, and they said, yes, I, I want to make two bucks. And he would sell the blood. And he did that for a few years, and eventually it was just more convenient to keep them in their own housing unit. And then they, when they left, he decided it was better to lock them in. People would die, and right before they would die, he would put them on a bus out of town, they would die out of town. So we don't know how many people he killed. Um, this is one of the guys who, who claimed he had his blood um, stolen from him. Uh, he... Uh, He's a, he was a nice guy, but he said he was uh, actually mugged on the street and had his blood drained from him. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, the other way that, that, so again, bodies are commodities. Once you start thinking of them as, as the, there's money in your body, you could really do anything. And this is the most shocking story that I've worked on. I think about this story all the time. And uh, there's an enormous market for children in the adoption streams. When you, if you meet somebody who has an adopted child, uh, you usually think this is a good thing. You've, you've helped a child out of a dangerous, bad situation. Orphanages are terrible places to grow up. We all know this, right? Orphanages, you grow up there, you grow up usually developmentally disabled with a disease profile. It's not good to be in an orphanage. Um, but the reality is, well that's a reality, the other reality is, is that orphanages get a lot of money when they sell a child, when they, when, they, when they adopt out a child. To do international, from India for instance, it's about $14,000 that an orphanage will get. Um, they, and that's money that they depend on to support their institution. But, let's say you have one of these orphanages, you're taking care of 100 kids and they're all sick. Right? They're all sick, they're all getting development disabled. The more, they're, they're there for six months and they're visibly sick. How do you sell, how do you get an American family to want to buy one of these children and adopt them into their household? Uh, it's, it's a real problem because the, the market economics for bananas is not so unlike the market economics for adoption. Um, the way you get healthy, cute children that, that look great and look those little profiles is you kidnap them off the streets. Uh, and it's, this, is, this is really all over the world. I, I, I was in India, this happened like right next door to me, but this is rampant in Guatemala, it's rampant in Korea, it's, it's rampant in Africa. Um, you, remember, you probably remember this case in Haiti recently where after the earthquake, the Christians came in and they came, they came away with a bunch of kids and no one knew where they got them. This is, this, it's, like, it's, it's just like with the kidney trade, disaster happens, uh, child brokers come in. So this is one of the many women, I, I met, I met three women who had their kidna kids kidnapped uh, from this orphanage called Malaysian Social Services in Chennai. Uh, and it was very sad. Um, her, his, this is Zabine, uh, the, the girl is Zabine, his name is Salim, sort of rhymes. Uh, kidnapped in 1999, the, ki the, the kid was adopted to Australia. We were able to track her to Australia through adoption records. Um, these, this is Sivagama and Nageshwar Rao. The, the, this is the story I wrote for Mother Jones. Um, and in 1999, their son, Subash, was hanging out by a water, water uh, filler-upper thing. And, uh, and Sivagama went inside to do something or other, came back, and the kid had been taken um, from, the, from the, the pump in 99. Uh, he went to Malaysian Social Services, uh, sold there for about, uh, I don't remember what they got, let's say 200 bucks. And, uh, and the kid was in, I believe, 2000, adopted to Wisconsin through an orphanage there, sorry, an adoption agency there called Paquette, which is still in business and has done several of these adoptions. Uh, I traced this kid through court records and through sort of general sneakiness, and we've, we've, uh, um, I didn't write this in the book, but last, about two months ago, we found that the DNA test um, proves that they're genetically related 
to them. And this, the, you know, and that's the end of the story. They're, 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 the kid's not going back to India. There's, they're, what do you do when a kid's been away for 10 years? You leave him with the rich family. We, there's no mechanism for even th dealing with this stuff. And we've, we've left this profit motive just, just there. Um, here he is. That's him. Uh, and I have like five minutes left, right? Okay, you can also buy and sell hair. <laughs> And surrogate mothers can have sell their, rent their wombs out and get locked in this nice little facility. Um, white eggs from Easter, you know, if you, if you're, if you, you know, you probably have seen the papers, right? All you women can sell your eggs. Don't accept less than fifty thousand dollars. You're all worth it. Um, but uh, but you know they'll they'll say eight. That's, you can get better than that. Um, anyway, if you want cheaper eggs, though, you go to you go to Eastern Europe, and you know you get some nice white pretty ladies who will sell their eggs for like. 300 bucks. That's the, that's the cheap market. Um, okay. And uh, you'll have to read the book for the, the total details. But I, I want to end with this, um, with two things. I want to talk about Loretta, Loretta Hardesty. This is a, a photo that was taken in uh, 1945, right at the end of World War II. And she, it's in uh, Allende, uh, uh, San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. And what do you guys see when you see this picture? Marshall, what do you see when you see this picture? Um, bones scattered in a, like a graveyard. Okay, who is this lady? Isn't she pretty? I, she, <laughs> she, she looks pretty out of place to me. And I see this picture as like the entire red market, just writ large. In, in, in 46, this was published in Life magazine as an, a, a sort of a fluff piece about um, an art school uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, and the GI Bill had just allowed GIs to get some money and they could go educate themselves. And they all flocked down to Mexico because it was cheap. And, you know, and, and at this art school, uh, her name is Loretta Hardesty. Here's the, here's, the, here's the caption, original caption. Uh, material for anatomy is plentiful at a cemetery where many old bones have been unearthed. Student Loretta Hardesty of Butte, Montana, uh, January 4th, 1947. Uh, after this photo ran in, in, that, in that issue, um, the art school uh, in San Miguel de Allende, the applications went up from 200 a year to more than 4,000. Uh, there was also a nude photo next to it, so maybe that was also part of it. Um, <clears throat> But here's what I say about it. The photo in life is not striking because it depicts a horrible crime, but because of the juxtaposition of a pretty young woman in a field of scattered bones. For an art student, it didn't matter how the bones left the grave, only that they were good subjects for anatomical studies in the first place. The image is a microcosm of every red market that has ever existed. Both Guzman, who's the photographer, and Hardesty are passive observers to a supply chain that begins and ends in human tragedy. If you look at this photo, I doubt the people who, whose bones these were wanted their bones scattered like that. I doubt they wanted them to be anatomical studies or, or anything like this. But we are just these passive observers. Even these kids are more interested in what she's doing than this scene here. And, and we just are not questioning, and those GIs didn't question where these bones are coming from and what we're doing. And this is what happens every day on the red market. We only look at the great art school and the pretty young girl, and we don't look at the grave. Um, and, uh, and that's my talk. So there you are. Yes, questions? It's my term. Trademark, you even say it, you owe me a nickel. <laughs> no, you don't owe me a nickel. You can, you can use it as much as you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. Do you have trouble getting access to some of the people you talked with? Did you ever have to use deception or anything like that? I, as a rule, I do not lie. Um, when I'm reporting, I, I think that, that people do sometimes use those. I don't necessarily dislike the, them for doing that, but uh, I find that because fact-checking is so important with magazines, if you go there and tell them that you're going to want to buy a kidney because your kidneys have failed, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to come back to them a week later and be like, I just want to be sure that I got your quote correct. Um, so I, I don't... <laughs> So, so I, I, I just don't do that on, on a principal basis. Um, 
I, I have done sneaky things. I, I like I, I've sort of I've bribed uh, court officials to get court records. Um, I've worked with people who I don't know how they get their information. I just didn't really ask questions. I mean, uh, one of the, the 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 very most difficult things about and and I think the most powerful things in my book is that there's absolutely no transparency in any of these markets. In order to get this information, this is hard one. It took six years um, to get this. You cannot get statistical information on the criminal black markets. They just don't issue those statements, and they really should, because the trade would be valuable information. Um, so what I think we need to do to actually, you know, we don't need Scott Carney's running all over the world getting anecdotes. What we, what we want are, are hard statistics of the legal markets in, in the world so that we can understand what the illegal markets are doing. We should release all the information about uh, about cyclosporin around the world and, and, the, and the transplant rejection drugs. We should know how much of that's in circulation, but Bayer and, and these other pharmaceutical companies hide it. They don't want to tell you how much they're selling in China because they don't want to tell you how many organ transplants are going because we know what, we could find out what the legal number is. Um, I think that we, we need to make absolutely everything transparent. There should be a Google search. You can search, you know, you could just put in Steve Jobs' name. You know the name of the guy who gave him his liver. I think that we, we should be that transparent. Uh, and I think that'll drive down the market in some ways, but I also think it could drive it up if you have other systems in place. Yeah. Question. So how did you find a lot of the real people for your stories? Like Colin, the guy who said he was kidnapped by the rickshaw. Mm -hmm. um, no, Colin was the, was the woman. Um, uh, he, uh, how did I find that guy? It's always weird. It's always just luck, actually. Um, I think, I, I think a, a local reporter in Gorakhpur um, had, knew of this story, and I knew what the village was in, he was in. And villages, everyone sort of knows each other. So I just sort of I knew his name. It was Kadar. Not, I was like, hey, does anyone know Kadar? He had his blood stolen. And they're like, oh, yeah, that guy. He lives over there. So it was really just, uh, it, it, you know, it was just a shot in the dark. And, I, you know, a lot of this is just, like, me running around hoping that I find something. And, and that's, you know, investigative journalism is hard stuff because sometimes you go out there, you'll search for a week and get nothing. And I hate it when that happens. Yes? Um, did you ever find that the journals in the countries you were in were also covering the stories or were they sort of receptive to you wanting to cover Yeah, there are so many brilliant journalists around the world who are really interested in this, in these issues. Um, and, uh, Oftentimes they're not given much space to analyze them, and I think this is a real problem with uh, journalism standards in other countries and editorial decisions. But uh, yeah, I mean, this book wouldn't have been possible without collaborations with lots of people who are all in my acknowledgments. Um, but yeah, I think that, I don't know how many of you are reporting students, are any of you journalists? Okay, so here's, here's your, when you become reporters, share all of your sources and just talk to everyone, because we're the last, it, this wouldn't happen. You wouldn't get this information if people weren't always talking to them. Everyone have a little piece of the story, and you wouldn't get these global pictures. So it's really important to collaborate and not worry about losing your story, because sometimes the story can't be told. Yeah. Are you ever worried about repercussions? I mean, I'm sure you are, but how do you deal with that on a daily basis? Like, like what? Like getting chopped up and sold in yeah. bathtub? Yeah. Bathtubs don't happen. No. <laughs> really? No, they don't go after... Uh, no, I, I'm chopped up in a bathtub. Like shot or something? Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, so I did, I worked on this for six years. I was uh, never threatened by any of the people involved in any of these trades. They're, they're mostly doctors. They mostly have white lab coats. Uh, they just don't ask questions about where things came from. Um, th they all think they're great people. And when you're talking to them, you're like, why are you a great person? And they'll tell you why they're a great person, because they know where to get kidneys and no one else does. And that's generally the way it goes. Um, this is not an underground mafia of gun-toting thugs, usually. <laughs> I haven't met the gun-toting thug ones, and I would, really would like to, and I think I would take some sort of precaution going, going into there. And, and, you know, usually by the time you get to the gun-toting thugs, they're already in jail. You know, they're, they're, they're usually have, have been caught in some big scandal, and then, you know, you're talking them through bars, so that's totally safe, too. Um, other story, I mean, I've, I've worked in other stories. I've worked in war zones in a where I've been held up and been in much more danger, but not in this book. So. Yes. Just if, if you're behind me, just yell. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I was just wondering if you if you ran into any weird stories from the world of traditional medicine, because I know sometimes those markets intersect a little bit. Like what? What are you? Where Where are you coming from on that? Biobody farms. Oh, yummy! Yeah, the, you can eat those. Apparently. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Because yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know the the so I, I'm this photo here. This was sort of funny. Talk about dead ends, right? 
oh God, that's a great pun. Um, the, the, uh, um, so I, I was searching for bone factories around India. You know, I, I had like a month to, 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 to sneak around. And I'd read about this bag of tibias on the Indo-Bhutan border that, that I also knew had been, been captured. And I went up there and I found this bag and a, and, and a bunch of skull, to, the tops of skulls. And I, it turned out that it was just an entirely different bone trade. Like you can sell bones as ritual instruments. They grind them up as some sort of Chinese medicine. I don't know exactly what it's for. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are definitely lots and lots of markets. I've, I've, I, there are stories in, uh, coming out of Nigeria right now where, where um, they will uh, rape women and then uh, so that they can give, give birth to kids and then they'll sacrifice the children. I mean, this stuff is happening. I didn't write a book on all that stuff um, because the markets are just different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's totally present and, and horrible. The, the world's horrible. <laughs> yes. Sure, yeah. And there's a medical um, benefit to having spare right. parts. Mm -hmm. Right, but is there, is there an ethical way to police this industry, or what would that look like? Well, I've been debating this issue since I started writing the book. I don't have any firm answers, because I think that ultimately this has to come with a conversation within many, many different communities. But I think whatever solution shows up has to be, in its heart, transparency. We can't look at bodies as as commodities. We can't look at, at kidneys as if they were pieces of meat that you buy in styrofoam at a grocery store. We need to think about these things. And I don't mind if there's money involved. I, you can pay someone for a kidney. And I don't necessarily think that's wrong because we're already paying people for kidneys, right? It's all, this is already what's happening. We're just ignoring the actual system. And uh, what I do think needs to happen is that, that, that it needs to be transparent. We need to realize that when you buy a skeleton, it was a person. Put a name on that skeleton. I'm looking at Herman the skeleton, or you know, more likely like Sengupta the skeleton. But you know, we, 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 need, to, we need to have uh, identities with all of these body parts because if we're really gonna talk about, about uh, humans not being commodities, not being uh, in commerce with it, then why don't we take on the liabilities that come with, with moving a body part? Why, when you get a kidney transplant in the States in a legal situation, it's a, from a cadaver donor, why do they not tell you what family um, it came from? Why does the, the, the donor family, why, why does the doctor come in and be the middleman? And the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that because they don't want people arranging their own organ transplants because it would, it would cut down on the costs. It would raise, it would raise their costs. They don't, you know, it, this, this sort of donor-based system, the legal system, is a free source of raw materials for these industries. Uh, and, they, and they have no real interest, no material interest to actually increase all of that. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult situation. Does that answer the question? Or am I? Yeah, I think, uh, I wasn't looking for an answer, mm. but Yeah. Yeah. It's got. It's got to be transparency. If, if we if we keep the legal markets transparent, the the illegal markets would have to follow suit because they're all hiding behind these lab coats. They're all hiding behind the idea of medical privacy in, or or social worker privacy in the case of, of of kidnapped children. And if we were able to say that if all markets were open, we're always able to trace adoption records and organ records, we'd at least have a starting point to combat it. it. I mean, obviously there would be forgeries of documents and all that stuff would go, go on there, but it would really, really help uh, a lot. And, you know, there's, there's, people also ask me occasionally whether we should have a commercial market for organs or, or, and, and bones and whatever else or not. And I'm sort of agnostic to that. I think we already have a commercial market for organs. You don't go to, when you get an organ transplant, you don't go there and, and they, they say, oh, you need an organ? Well, we found a donor and we'll just give you the organ. It costs $250,000, you know, up to a million dollars for intestines. And, you know, there's, there's like, there's, there's a lot of money to be made. These transplant centers advertise on billboards, say, look at our great transplant center. You've, I'm sure you've seen these billboards. And that helps the reputation of the hospital. So it's, it's a very valuable thing. So for us to say that this is truly 
all altruism is just basic hypocrisy. It's, a, it's a, ultimately a lie. So part of me thinks if we're already commercial, let's at least make it commercial and ethical. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right. That's it. Isn't the simple answer uh, voluntary donations? I mean, why? Well, just like it works with blood, uh, I mean, where there wouldn't be enough of a supply? Or? Well, no, voluntary <laughs> donations um, just don't work. There's not enough supply. Um, and, and if you, is, the thing is, is as you create bigger, bigger commercial systems, uh, you have doctors getting paid, you have those guys who drive the ambulances with the things full of ice and the helicopter pilots and all that costs money, these, these hospitals, and they have an incentive to perform more of these operations so that they can get more done. So what we've actually built is a commercial system, even if it's non-profit, there's still money being made, right? You've built a commercial system on top of a voluntary uh, system. So you're hoping that the supply of altruism can increase to a point that will, that will sa satiate the commercial need. But that doesn't happen. If you look since the beginning of, the, of NODA, where the, or the, the UNOS keeps these records, and you can just go search through them. And the organ transplant list is 10 years now, and it was 10 years then, but we have 20 times the amount of available organs. That's because every year they um, say, uh, oh, look, we have more organs. We'll put more people on the transplant list because we found more uses for organs. It's the same with blood. When blood in, in 1780, there was zero demand for blood, right? And then in the, in the, in the, the teens and 30s, we found that, that by using more blood, we could do more extensive operations, and, the more, and there was more demand for blood uh, over and over again. So I don't think you can satiate the problem by just addressing the, the, um, the demand side. I think you also have to look at, 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 I think supply itself creates the demand for these, these, these things. Yo. You. <laughs> Sorry. It's all different for every single person, uh, has a different uh, view. Some of them complain, I mean, if we're talking, are you talking kidneys or what are you talking here? I'm talking about the woman who was cheated out of her $800 and lost a bunch of money or... Yeah, she was, she was upset that, that she, was, she was cheated. She wasn't really thinking about it in the sense that should organ trading be illegal or legal. She was thinking, hey, where's my other $800? The, the question in my mind, though, is what happens when we create a whole stable of people who are organ suppliers and another stable of people who are organ consumers? Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the people who had their kids kidnapped, they're devastated. They spent all of their money. They, had, they sold their little hut um, to, provide, to, to hire private investigators who investigated all over India and didn't find anything. Um, I mean, uh, the, with the, this bone story, I, I have uh, met a guy who is his, the, the graves of his, uh, of his village are routinely robbed. Um, you know, robbed every, you know, every time someone dies, someone comes and steals a, a, steals a body like a, a two or three days later. So they have lookouts they have to post and they stay up all night watching and it doesn't always work. I mean, it's, it can be devastating and emotionally and physically devastating. So, uh, you. You had a question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question that might on the surface seem a little sadistic. Mm. Um, and Great. Um, <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> my question is that um, given the impending population crisis, mm. do you think there will be a point when organ donation is seen as unsustainable, given that it's, it's a way of seeing human life as renewable? Yeah. Good question. I, yeah. I think that we, we have a drive towards immortality. I think that part of these, um, part of the problem in, at, least, at least with organs, is that we're trying to prolong life over and over again, and we're saying we'll do every technological innovation as far as we have money and resources to get it to extend our lives. But when you get an organ transplant, your life is greatly improved from dialysis, no doubt, because you can walk around and you can you know, do things. But it's still living with a chronic condition because you're on immunosuppressants. You're, you know, it, it's sort of like trading, being tethered to a dialysis machine for AIDS. Um, you know, it, it, so it's not this phoenix-like rebirth, but we will, you know, there, there is this drive over and over again to, to push those limits. And, and, I, and I think if, if someone could, if the science got there, it's not there yet, but 
you know, replace every single body part as they fail. I'm sure someone would do that. Um, Population-wise, it's only going to happen for the rich people. You know, the, whoever comes up first is, yeah, he's not going to have access to that, you know. Uh, and you had a question. So, just as a side note to that, the, there's a book, uh, Never Let Me Go, the <coughs> Kazuo Ishiguro, like a science yeah. fiction book about the Genji and what would happen if he could clone people and treat them as organs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's some real world. And it's very like, a consideration. And there's real, some weird real world attempts to try to create that, but we'll go into that some other day. Uh, you had a question. Okay. Are we done? You guys? All right, I'll go with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the thing that I'm thinking about is uh, so you were talking about how if there is more transparency, that might be a, a, you know, a step toward a mm -hmm. solution, but it strikes me that. That is kind of uh, endorsing the, the the market further because it's sort of suggesting that uh, the like perfect access to information will make the market work better, and so there's still the issue that the people who would have the goods to bring mm -hmm. to market are still going to be exploited. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's not a perfect solution. That's, uh, I, that's not really a question. Of yeah. No, I, 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 yeah, no, totally. It's, it, it's, a, it's a, this, this subject's sort of a bummer. I didn't say this wasn't happy lecture. This was, this was organ trading. <laughs> um, no, I mean you're, you're totally right. I mean we live in a, a world of vast global inequalities, and at some point uh, we need to, we can either say we're going to try to do a principled system that will truly stop a lot of these things, which is like no organ donations, right? That seems really extreme. Or we can say we live in a society where there's inequalities and there are going to be criminals doing this stuff anyway. Maybe we can do a little better. I think I'm a little bit more on that side. But yeah, as for solving, I mean, the, this, this lecture is sort of about organ crimes, but it's also we're, what we're really looking at is global poverty in itself and global desperation in itself. And people are, are pushed into these, to the, these positions as sellers or not sellers. And I'm just looking at the fallout. Someone else? We're done? Oh, yes. Question. Um, in the article that you wrote about um, the, the kidnapping mm -hmm. um, of the child, I was just wondering kind of what your ethical decision-making process was to confront the family that their child had in fact been stolen, and if you ever worried that maybe you crossed the line as a journalist, maybe that wasn't your place. I'm not saying that's what I think. I'm no, um, <laughs> interesting enough, so I pitched that story to several magazines. It ended up in Mother Jones. Um, uh, it, 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 and the New Yorker passed on it for exactly that reason. They were worried that it would be, uh, I would be no longer be an objective observer in this. I would be sort of part of the story. Mother Jones said, that's actually good. We, we want you to, to take uh, ethical stands on these issues. Um, personally, I have zero problems with confronting that family. This family uh, had, had a child who was kidnapped. We knew the crime was there. We knew the FBI was doing nothing. I mean, they had been sitting on these files for at least five years by the time I got there. I mean, the FBI should have told them, right? Uh, the, or the, the CBI, the Indian uh, counterpart, should have told them. So what I did it was merely push this story forward. And because I got there, um, the FBI did process DNA samples. And these people are not able to say, um, you know, when I, when I talked to the family, basically their response was, this is, you know, we know it's a possibility because the guy had actually read articles about the orphanage in other news sites and sort of knew that maybe the, he had a kidnapped kid. So his first interaction with me was like, yeah, I thought this was possible. His second interaction with me, I met him twice, was if there's no way this is possible, I know he's my kid. And, and then he said, and because he realized that, that maybe he'd have to have a relationship with that family in India who did not want him back. I mean, the kid, they wanted him back, but they were willing to say, we just want a relationship with this family because we know time has passed. And the family in America had did nothing for that. And I feel like sometimes you have to use the, the press as a bludgeon uh, to, to make anything happen. Although, you know, I still kept all of their identities secret. You know, uh, all the names were changed. I did not name the town where they came from. I did my, F, my, my best to, to shield, especially the minor, from, from being sort of used as a pawn. But I think that we need to raise these issues. We need to say, you know, what would happen if an American kid from Chicago was taken and kidnapped and sold to an Indian uh, slum? Like, we would send, like, the troops in to go pick him up, right? I mean, I mean is it just because these people are, are poor and, you know, look like, 
Right, where is that? Uh, look like, you know, just because just they look like this, is, that, is, he, is he the reason why he can't get his daughter back? No. I mean, you know, take some ethical stands on this. I mean, hell, no one else is. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.